Hey, and welcome to another episode of Collab with Kiva. I am your host, Kiva Slade, and today we are going to talk about marketing strategies for 2023. So whether it is the big R word that some people are saying, some people are not, or just the fact that the online space has become more noisy. It is so imperative that each of us as business owners factor in marketing into our strategic planning and into what we are looking to do as we head into 2023. And grant it. For some of us, marketing may not be our forte. It's not our strength. It's not our jam. It's not that thing that lights us up, but we know that it is so necessary for us, for our businesses, and for us to impact others through our businesses. So what does that leave us? It leaves us needing to put together a marketing plan for 2023 and thinking through bits and pieces of that and what it looks like and what it feels like in order to arrive at what it should be. Now, granted, we've learned anything over the past few years. We can't set anything in stone, okay? There needs to be a level of flexibility with this plan. There needs to be a willingness to kind of dance with it. And when necessary, maybe we're changing the tempo or changing the music just a tad bit so that we actually get to where we're trying to go. So I've written out a few things today that I think help when thinking about your marketing plan. And however you decide to plan and brainstorm and whatever works best for you, hey, do that. For me, I love the big white sticky notes that you can stick on the wall. You can get them on Amazon from a two-pack, and I like to write. So for me, there's three sticky notes that you cannot see that are over there about marketing strategy, and a lot of it came out of a coaching call that I had. And I think it's important to talk through those ideas with someone else. Maybe it's in a peer-led mastermind, maybe you do have a coach and or inner mastermind, but it's definitely important. So the things I'm going to share, you might already know, but have you actually acted on them? Because it's one thing to know, and it's a totally different thing to actually act on what you know. Okay, so first things first, who do you want to serve? Who do you want to serve? I think that in 2022, some of us have realized that maybe we don't want to serve the people that we've been serving. Maybe the people who are attracted to you are not the people who make the most ideal clients for you. Whatever that situation might be, it's important for you to gain some level of clarity on who you want to serve. Again, we're not holding tight to that. We're acknowledging that for right now, this is who I want to serve. And I think what's coupled with that is that who you want to serve actually needs what it is that you are trying to serve them with, okay? So if they don't need it, no matter how much you want to serve them, they are not going to be served by you because they don't need what it is that you are offering. So making sure that who you want to serve is aligned with and they need what it is that you are providing goes hand in hand. For example, I have a client who she serves women business owners. We'll just kind of say that. She likes though doing more corporate work where there's just more kind of strategic planning and things of that sort, not so much daily in the doing. And you have to be able to say, okay, there's those are two different people you're talking to. Okay, so what they need is going to be different. So you have to make sure that what you're offering actually meets the needs of those that you say you want to work with. 
So it's really important that you have some level of understanding of who you want to serve and that you understand them enough to know that they need what it is that you are selling. You know, like the old adage, you don't bring sand to the beach, okay? Like, you do not go to the beach saying, hey, can I sell you a jar of sand? No one at the beach, surrounded by free sand, is wanting to buy sand from you. They don't need it. They don't need it. So, being clear on who you want to serve and making sure that what you're offering actually is something that they need You need that level of clarity. Again, and I will repeat this ad nauseum, don't hold tight to it. Our economy, our world economy is shifting. Okay, so three months from now, six months from now, you might need to make a slight tweak in that. I want you to give yourself the flexibility and the grace to actually do that instead of being rigid. Now, the next one, (laughs) we're going to get in your business. How much does it cost to run your business? We are approaching the end of the year. For many, that means you need to start working on your books and make sure that you have all of your ducks in a row, pennies and all the other things, okay? When I was a seller on Etsy, I was a part of a group, um, shout out to Janet, um, who every single month, at the beginning of the month, you got a email saying like basically (laughs) do your books okay and the reason for that monthly accountability was for the simple fact that if you waited to the end of the year it felt like such a heavy task especially in a product-based business like something like jewelry where you started the year with 3,422 beads and you finished the year with 1229 beads like you're, you like you literally in some cases um people who were sewers people who were knitters like you had granted there's a level of estimation going on here but you really actually had to not only do your financial books in that came actually understanding your inventory books And how many beats were left? Like, because all of those numbers factor into and roll into your next tax year because they are part of your beginning inventory. And you had to have a number of what your beginning inventory was as well as your ending inventory for the current year in order to assess what that was going to be going into the next year. And your accountant was going to look for this information. Trust me. So Janet would send out, as a part of this group, a monthly accountability so that you did your books monthly. So when the end of the year came, you weren't begrudgingly having to tackle doing your books. I share this because you need to know how much it costs to run your business, whether it's your your own, you know, CEO pay, whether it's overhead, whether it's direct costs. Do you have a team? What does it cost in terms of operating your business? What are your subscriptions? Do you utilize Dubsado or HoneyBook, Um, Adobe, like some sort of e-signature thing? Do you utilize QuickBooks? How much are you paying for that? How much is your accountant and or bookkeeper costing you? How much is this going to cost? How much are your taxes? How much are all of these things that factor into the running of your business? And yes, we are talking about marketing, but even in speaking about marketing, we have to know this financial number. Because setting a marketing goal to, I want to have 10 new customers on X offer, by the end of the year. Well, say that offer is $2,000 and we're going to keep it simple here because, you know, this is math on the go. So 10 new customers for this $2,000 offer is $20,000 for the year. And you do your math and you say, well, it cost me $35,000 to run my business. Well, ding, 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 red flashing alarms. We have a problem. Your money is not going to meet your needs. Okay, so it's important that you know how much it costs to run your business. 
And yes, sometimes rolling up your sleeves and getting into those nitty gritty numbers, you realize that, hey, maybe I'm paying for something that I don't need. Maybe I am, you know, I've paid for things that I have not utilized and that will make you want to utilize them. I'm probably preaching to myself with that one, but it's important to know that number. And tied to that number is how much do you need to bring into your house as your CEO pay? Okay, and that number is going to be different for each and every one of us. Okay, those that are married, maybe your business, your spouse has enough funds coming in and your business is kind of the extras. Your business takes care of piano lessons. Your business takes care of a trip to Disney. Your business takes care of you getting your nails done and paying for the housekeeper. Like whatever that is, it's your business and it's your number. Okay, for other people, your business actually helps support the bills. Like you might be head of household. Uh, The other night I was watching the Toni Morrison documentary on Netflix and she spoke about, I want to say it was in the 70s when she was an editor at Random House and she noticed that all of the white male editors received more money than she did when it came time to the end of the year for the bonus. And she said she was a single mom. And she said to her boss, like, dude, I'm head of household, just like you, just like these other men. I deserve that same amount of money. And she wound up getting it. But she had to know, like, again, your situation might be different. If you are head of household and you are a single mom, like, your business CEO pay number is going to be different than someone else's. But it is important for you to know what that number is. So what is that number that you need to bring home in your business? Because that number ties into the number of how much it costs to run your business. Because while reinvesting in our businesses is great and there are years that we might need to take more out of our business than others, we're not in this to work for free. So CEO pay is important. And as a result of that, you figuring out what your CEO pay number is And of course, that needs to be added to things like, what's your taxes for your business? Like, what's your direct costs? What's your overhead? You know, where's a profit? What profit level do you want to be at in your business? Again, these are not things that are universal for everyone in the sense of, oh, it's going to be this percentage, this percentage, this percentage. No, those numbers vary for every single one of us. So Getting into the nitty gritty of your numbers is definitely important because your numbers, those numbers we've just been talking about, how much it costs to run your business, as well as how much you need to bring home and CEO pay, those help set your sales goals. Remember we were talking, oh, I want 10 people at $2,000. Oh, that wasn't enough money. I don't want you in this cycle of I want 10 people, oh, I'll make my offer $3,000. That still doesn't make you have enough. That's only 30,000. So getting clarity on your numbers, having confidence in your numbers, knowing why your pricing is the way that it is based on your numbers is critically important. It's really foundational because it impacts how you show up to sell your offer. Because if you don't believe that the number is the number based on actual numbers and you're just like, I woke up this morning and I was thinking, you know what, $4,000, that's what my offer is going to be. The first time you go to sell that, you can't sell it because you don't really believe that it's worth $4,000. You don't think that's the investment for it. You don't think that's the transformation. You're like, I'm not giving these people $4,000 worth of transformation. I cannot sell this offer. So then... What I see happens, fast action bonus. If you sign with me right now, I'll take off $1,000, okay? And if you do this, I'll also add in this, 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 and that. So now you've sold them for $3,000 and actually probably $6,000 offer because you were going after the cash and had no confidence in the numbers that led to the price. So... Knowing your numbers, and remember they're going to be different for every one of us, is critically important as you move forward with trying to set together your sales goals, which leads into your marketing strategy. 
So next thing you need to focus on, how you're planning to serve these people. We talked earlier about your offer being something that they need, but also how are you going to serve them? What are the bits and pieces of your offer? Again, the online space is noisy right now. Very, very loud and clamorous. It's like an um, outdoor air, air market where just everyone is hawking their goods and trying to get someone's attention. And with that being the case, how you're going to serve people is important. What does it look like for you to onboard them? Okay, like if someone's going to pay you $5,000 for a program or a service, they're going to have a level of expectation of what that looks like. And from the moment that they book a call with you to having that call with you to actually being onboarded as a client of yours, you need to think that process out. Is it a seamless process or is it a herky-jerky process? Do things get missed? Do clients not feel tended to? Do they not feel seen? Do they feel that you might have taken their money and they're not 100% sure if they're going to get what they paid for? You know, the reality is <laughs> that's happening in our space. We may not be the ones doing it, but there are people who are doing it, and that makes people a lot more guarded and more skeptical. So how are you going to serve them? Are you going to have like a white glove treatment and they feel so cared for, so ready to move forward? Do you set out expectations of what it's like to work with you? When should they expect X, Y, and Z, if there are X, Y, Z deliverables in the work that you do. What will be the means or mode of communication? How do they reach you? When can they reach you? Is there time to reach you outside of, say, a weekly or biweekly call? Do they have Voxer access to you? Do they have email access to you? If they have email access to you, how soon can they expect a response? There are things that need to be thought through in order for you to show up in your most excellent self and also in order for them to show up in their most excellent self. And that's important because then we're going to have some good success, okay? And we're both going to feel good about this process. If you've ever worked with someone and you feel that you've really undercut yourself and your services, you don't go into that feeling good. There's a lot of gritting of your teeth, clenching of your jaw because you're like, I cannot believe I've given away this for this pittance of, you know, whatever it is. And you're just feeling a lot of angst and frustration. And that comes out in the work that you do. It comes out in how you show up for the work that you do. So thinking through how you're going to serve someone, okay, is super important. Testing that, that process works, okay? Maybe it's a $37 download, but everybody's not getting the download. You're not, like, stressed about it. It's $37. They're ticked. They're like, I wanted my download. I want to be able to do whatever this thing is. So it's important to think through how you're serving these people. And not just the beginning onboarding port part, what does that continued serving look like? What does it look like to offboard them? Do they feel as cared for at the end of the process as they did in the beginning when you took their money? Because if they feel cared for at the end of the process, when there is no more money to be exchanged, and they leave feeling well taken care of, needs were met, they were served with excellence, you best believe you have a referrer for life because of how you serve them, okay? So that's really important. And if you find something's not working in your process, fix it, tweak it, do what you need to do 
to make sure that that process feels good on both sides. The next thing to think about is, how do you need to speak to these people? You've already determined who you're speaking to. How do you need to speak to them? What is it that you need to say to them? Okay, what is it that you need to say to grab their attention? So you can call it their pain points, you can do your market research, but you need to know what needs to come from you that actually is going to strike a chord with them and resonate. So how do you speak to them? And since you've already figured out where they are, okay, it's important because if you're speaking to them on LinkedIn, you're not going to speak to them on LinkedIn the same way you speak to them on TikTok. And I believe it was two episodes ago we talked about the kind of Hootsuite report and just digital trends looking forward into 2023. Being strategic about where you are is super important. And cross-posting that many of us have done for convenience isn't going to continue to work because each platform serves a different purpose and need. Okay, so if you're being entertaining, okay, TikTok and some reels on IG, okay, edutainment, um, that's really great and wonderful, okay, but there's some other things that those may not, there's a time and place I think they can work on things like LinkedIn, but not like as a continual part of your strategy, and so it's important to figure out now that you know where they are, and what you need to say to them, also figuring out how you're saying it to them, okay? So I say all of these things because one of the things that I realize is missing sometimes, not only in my own business, but clients' businesses, is actual lead generation. Because you have a sales goal now. We've talked about how much money needs to come in But how do your marketing strategy as part of that getting to, that feeds into that, your lead generation, excuse me, feeds into that marketing strategy? Like, how are you actually going to get these people um, that's going to help you get to your goals, okay? Because if you don't have leads, you're not going to have sales, you know? And a referral is still a lead. Just because Sally tells me to go purchase Jane's item, I love Sally dearly. That does not mean, though, that I'm automatically going to go give Jane my money. I got to get to know Jane. Do I really like Jane like Sally might like Jane? Because Sally liked Anna, but I did not like Anna. So it's really important to think through lead generation. Salespeople will tell you that sales is like a numbers game, you know. Companies do advertising on TV because it's a numbers game, okay. I can guarantee you that if I put an ad in the Super Bowl, it's going to yield me X number of eyeballs. That's why Super Bowl ads are so super expensive, okay. Now that most of us, though, watch them when they're leaked prior to, I'm not always sure of the relevance and effectiveness, but I'm sure that it's still there, Okay, but who doesn't want to watch the Super Bowl, even non-football players, for like, well, I haven't seen them lately, but like the old Anheuser-Busch commercials with the sweet horses and the dogs. Like, I just want to see that. And I'm not going to go buy Anheuser-Busch, but I know that brand so readily without them showing their words. If you show me a horse and a dog, I'm in there like, okay, it's Anheuser-Busch. We're, we're going to watch a commercial and it's going to be sad and cute and, and all the things. Okay, but, and I've talked about this before, like you're driving on the highway and the yellow Frito-Lay truck comes by. Frito-Lay is not wrapping trucks because they have nothing better to do. They are wrapping trucks because as that truck rides down Interstate 95, 85, 17, I mean, well, I think all the major interstates are fives and zeros, so 10, whatever the interstate is, they're going to pass X number of eyeballs. 
Okay, so grocery stores, Walmart, the Amazon truck, UPS, FedEx, like we see them, we we know what they are, brand recognition, awareness sets in and we're like, oh yeah, hmm, might go buy such and such, might need to order such and such, X, whatever the thing is that comes up for you, okay, and you're a lead, okay, and it's important for your people, whoever they are, <laughs> to also have that brand recognition, brand awareness of you, okay? So just because I go to Jane's, I now need to see Jane. I need to see if I see in Jane what Sally saw in Jane and that it resonates with me that I want to give Jane my money. So having a strategy that's 100% based on referrals, there are people who can do it, but for many people, depending on where you are in the trajectory of your business, you're going to need it to be a part of your strategy, but it cannot be your entire strategy. And some of you may want to fight me on that. Bring it. Okay, so it needs to be a part of your strategy. Relationship marketing, totally, 100%. Like, we do buy from people that we know. We buy from people that we like, okay? There are some people that, oh, I don't like her voice, or I don't like this, and I couldn't imagine working with her. And there's other people like, I absolutely love her, and I can't wait for when she does a video, and such and such and such and such, and oh, this is wonderful and great. Whatever it is, it's fine. <laughs> you're not going to, well, I've told you all before, you're not tacos. You will not make everybody happy. So with that being the case, though, actually coming to understand and know that you need a lead generation strategy and it's about numbers. What are you doing to get yourself in front of more eyeballs? That needs to be included in your marketing strategy. It has to be a part of that. Okay, because your pipeline needs to have people in it that are at different stages. Um, you want folks who are in your orbit. Are they seeing you consistently like they see a, a Netflix commercial or like they see the Frito-Lay truck? Like, are they seeing you consistently, whether that's in social? Um, do you show up? Do you have an email list? Are you showing up in their inbox consistently? Um or do they see you kind of like every now and then? Just boop. You kind of like pop up like whack-a-mole and you're like, oh, there she is. Oops, there she goes again. Oops, there she is over there. Nope, there she's gone down again. Like whack-a-mole should not be a part of your marketing strategy. And it's so important though that we think through really what is it that we want to what do we need to talk about going into the new year? How are we going to create that content? And how do all of those pieces work together? Because it really should be an ecosystem. Your marketing is also connected to your sales, which is also connected to your operations. All of these pieces need to dance together in order for there to be harmony in your business and your bank account. And it's in, it doesn't happen just miraculously. You have to plan for these things to happen. And I think one of the things that I've seen happen is people don't realize the, the cycle. Due to the recession or economic fears that are taking place, People are taking longer to buy. So maybe something previously, people just needed to be in your orbit for about three months and they were like, take my money. Now they might need to be in your orbit five to six months. So your sales cycle is extended now. But in the midst of that sales cycle, let's say month three, going into four, you think, Nothing I've been doing is working, and so I need to change, and I need to pivot, and I'm just going to start talking about something else. Well, 
the last three months that you've spent talking about apples, now you decide you want to start talking about kumquats. It's like people were just starting to realize that they wanted an apple and now they come to you, your website, your social, and they're like, she's no longer selling apples. Now she's selling kumquats. I don't know if I really want a kumquat. What is a kumquat? Now you're starting out that process of educating them all over again. It's like now we're starting at the beginning. No one wants to start all over again because if you keep doing that, no one knows exactly what it is that you're selling. So you have to realize that the sales cycle is longer. In addition to it being longer, you need to be consistent with your messaging and not throw in a towel when you think it's not working. And you need to be able to measure what is and what isn't working. So reviewing and getting ready for, so you're reviewing 2022 and what worked, what didn't work, and you're looking ahead to 2023 to figure out what you need to build on, what you might need to scrap, what you actually might need to tweak so that you have an effective marketing strategy going into the new year. And you're going to focus on who you want to serve, okay? And like, you know, what you're offering actually is what they want. All right, how much it costs to run your business? How much do you need to bring home? CEO pay, remember, we're not working for free. Um, how will you serve these people? How do you speak to them? Where do you find them? Okay, and what that looks like for you is not going to be a cut and copy paste version of what it looks like for someone else. So take the time to actually do this for yourself. And yes, you can take input from others, okay? But really think about what it needs to be for you. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, it's you. It is you who's going to have to show up. It is you who's going to have to be consistent. It is you who's going to have to deliver the service. It is you who has to first sell the service. So, and it's you that people are wanting to buy from and interact with. So... All the best to you as you make your 2023 marketing strategies and you are planning out how you are going to kick butt and take names in 2023 and serve people with excellence with whatever it is that you do. So tune in for the next episode and I'll talk to you soon.